recording is on. Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, today is the third day of a Zooming gathering. Thank you for joining us. And uh, today we have five speakers, uh, Ed, uh, Lynn, Fereshte, Raylan, and Maria here to share their technique and concept of creation with us. And so later on, please feel free to ask questions and give feedback. But remember to turn off your microphone when you're not speaking so that the echo won't interrupt the sharing. And today our first speaker will be Ed. So Ed, are you ready? I am, yes. Okay, so let's start. Okay, so this, well, this, fortunately, this may end up being a fairly short presentation considering we have five people. But um, to start with, uh, a little bit about me. Um, I have a master's in music performance percussion uh, from the University of Washington. Uh, my bachelor's was in the same thing uh, from Arizona State. Um, the last academic year, I was faculty in music technology at Montana State University, but I mean, these days I'm mostly just trying not to get the coronavirus. Um, that's that's kind of the, the daily hustle. Um, my own work tends to focus a lot on um, biofeedback techniques and sort of speculative and um, emerging technologies, as as with probably most of the people um, in this in this thing. Um, but particularly biofeedback and neurofeedback. Um, biofeedback itself is we're going to start very generally and kind of become more specific as this as this goes on and end up with kind of some things I've built. But biofeedback, and this is sort of a quote, is the process of gaining greater awareness of many physiological functions of one's own body commercially by using electronics or other instruments and with a goal of being able to manipulate the body's systems. So that's kind of um, it's a very academic and a little obfuscated definition, but in, in simpler terms, biofeedback is a collection of systems or techniques that allow the individual to interact with the unconscious processes of your body on the conscious level and change them, actually. Um, so the, the simplest and one of the most early forms of uh, biofeedback was what we call hand warming biofeedback. Um, from a physiological perspective, lower than average temperature in an individual's hands is um, very common in individuals with a subset of conditions, anxiety, migraines, menstrual problems, and stomach disorders are all very common. So if we set up a system with a, a temperature sensor on someone's hands and then monitor that, monitor that and a tone is played as a reward or you know, some kind of feedback is given, usually via computer system, um, when the sensor's temperature reaches a normalized range, um, this can actually alleviate symptoms. Um, in practice, hold on, I just heard a noise. Okay, I hope that wasn't, if, if you have a question, please just like say it out loud. Um, I, I'm happy to, to answer any, any questions that someone might have. Um, and this is, you know, I I had originally thought I was going Monday, so there's a lot of stuff I left out in this. Um, so so you 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 measure the EEG while you are also measuring the temperature of someone. And oh no, this is this is so far I haven't gotten to the EEG yet. So this is uh, actually an isolated technique that's a simpler form of what I'm going to talk about with the EEG. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so in practice, uh, hand warming biofeedback actually looks like, I'm, I might be about to date myself a little bit with this reference, so please bear with me if this isn't familiar. Um, but those of you who are kind of around in the 90s will recognize mood rings. Um, so the, the mood ring as it was originally implemented was actually basically a hand warming biofeedback device. Um, it would respond to temperature in your hands and could actually, via neuroplasticity, which is something I'm about to talk about, um, improve someone's well-being. Um, unfortunately, 
the original mood ring was uh, very effective and they sold quite a few of them. But after the copies started showing up using a different chemical mechanism, the, uh, the market sort of got flooded with non-functional versions of it. Um, so it, it's not really a thing anymore, but still. Um, so that kind of hopefully lays some of the conceptual groundwork, which is we create systems that produce positive um, reinforcement feedbacks like a ring changing color or a tone playing um, in response to unconscious bodily processes. Um, so that kind of brings me to the form of this that I usually work with or that I work with most these days, which is uh, EEG biofeedback. So um, some people might not be familiar with the phrase EEG or electroencephalogram. Um, basically, it's uh, putting a sensor net on your head in order to um, detect electrical current inside your brain, uh, more or less. Um, so in a clinical setting, this actually takes the form of a, a game that's played via brain computer interface. Um, still using the same conceptual underpinnings and uh, the same um, neurocognitive processes, but it's uh, where instead of using a temperature sensor, we're using an electroencephalogram and we can, we can develop some protocols and treat things that are uh, notably more complex. Um, and speaking of protocols, there's a lot of different ways these are constructed. There's a lot of different regions in the brain. There's frequency ranges. Um, there's also phase, um, which is important. I can talk a little bit more about that. But uh, there are some systems like uh, Esloretta, some other things that are based on what we call Z-scores, um, which are super complicated, but basically you you look at the levels and different frequency ranges in a set of standardized locations on your your head. I'm actually gesturing, but I realize you guys can't see me because my camera's not on. Um, and via statistics and comparing it to a sample of the average population, um, it's possible to detect both phase incoherency and amplitude incoherency or amplitude imbalance. And then via sensors placed in specific locations, it's possible to actually change the way the brain is behaving. Um, so what does that look like? Well, it looks a lot like this. I um, hope you guys can see my mouse. Uh, so as you can see, we have a, we have a client or a patient here. Um, these are cotton balls. There are gold cup electrodes with uh, 1020 paste under those. And you can see there's a game here basically. And when the, when the brain or the, the uh, client or patient or artist, in my case, his brain is within, um, within the acceptable ranges that are set in the software, this car here moves. And there's a ton of different games. Um, when I've done this for therapeutic purposes, it's principally been uh, basically playing Pac-Man with my brain, um, kind of fun. Uh, and you can see there's a secondary display for the, uh, the administrator or practitioner, um, which has all of the physiological data and a lot of the control suite for, for what's getting rewarded. Um, I can see I've already talked for 10 minutes, so let's move on. Um, so how does this work? In, inside the brain, um, or at least protocol-wise, I kind of mentioned this, but here's a nice little more succinct um, version of it, which is neurofeedback protocols look for imbalances between regions or frequency spectra and provide feedback in the form of sound, light, or touch that lets the brain correct itself. So the, the mechanism by which this works, um, and it, it does work, it's clinically proven, it's had an unfortunate phase where it got very caught up with like the, the 70s sort of uh, new age movements, but it's sort of back on the scientific path now. Um, is it's this isn't really a conscious mechanism by which this happens. Um, it's it's more like your brain can uh, do the operant condition th conditioning thing and then figure out its own path and own way to rewire itself. It's a lot like um, 
for people who are, are more sort of technically inclined, if you have something like an FPGA, um, the brain is a lot like an FPGA that can reprogram itself um, and re-optimize itself, which actually might be a thing now with machine learning, but I'm not an expert in that. Um, so neuroplasticity is a term we get used a lot, but it's it just essentially means uh, the ability of the brain to change itself in response to experiences, which um, is, you know, it's pretty obvious that we can do that when you think about it. So um, what does this mean for artists? Uh, practically, it means we have access to clinically proven techniques that can improve people's well-being and quality of life. Um, there are possible applications for this as far as uh, post-human technology goes. There's some evidence to suggest that uh, synesthesia, which is sort of a complex name for senses being crossed, so uh, synesthetes will frequently hear colors or taste sounds or um, actually seeing tastes is another one that's common. Um, and the, the sort of evolutionary underpinning is that uh, most children are synesthetes until a, it, through, through being toddlers. Um, so there's a way to, there's some research to suggest at least that you can use neurofeedback to kind of switch that back on um, and very literally change the way people perceive the world. Um, so a little bit about water. Um, a little bit about how I have applied this, um, and sorry, I'm, I guess I'm moving quite fast, so if you have a question, please, please again, just, just ask, and I'll make some time to, to talk about stuff at the end, but... Oh, can you, can you move back to the last page a little, for one, one second? This one? No, the last, the last. This one? Yeah. Okay. Just want to screenshot it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. You got it? Got it. Cool. Okay. My past projects. So the thing that got me started with all of this, uh, aside from having been through uh, neurofeedback for peak performance several times in my life, was I, I decided to take on this project. It's a, it's a composition. It's a work uh, after a fashion. I'll explain that in a second. But... Um, it's called Music for Solo Performer. It's by an American composer named Alvin Lussier, who's a, a sort of a famous um, East Coast of the U.S., very, like, avant-garde composer. And um, through some really odd means, he ended up with access in 1964, 1965, to some of the most early electroencephalogram technology that existed in the world. Um, and I'm actually going to tab over to my my website here. Hopefully this works. Here we go. Um, I have video up. I'm not going to play it right now because we got five people to get through today. Um, but I used uh, an OpenBCI headset. This is what this is. You guys, you guys can still see my screen, right? Okay. I'm I'm just going to assume that's that's what's happening. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. But I think we have 12 people now. Oh, cool. <laughs> OK, so I, you know, this is this is a very early sort of landmark piece uh, in the field of sonification, because essentially what it does is it takes uh, frontal cortex alpha rhythms, which is uh, signals that occur within the 8 to 12 hertz or cycles per second range. I know a lot of you guys aren't audio people, so a hertz is uh, one cycle. One hertz is one cycle per second. Um, and alpha in particular, and in not just alpha, not just alpha by itself, but alpha brain waves in that particular region of the brain are uh, characterized or a characteristic of a state of sort of wakeful, uh, like waking awareness and like not thinking about anything. It's what we might call mindfulness in the modern world. It's There's some correlation there. Um, so this piece, you take uh, your alpha waves, which are, again, something that requires you being calm and having very little anxiety, um, and you basically route those in real time through a bunch of really big speakers to resonate objects that you've built or that I built. 
um, and there were some other techniques involved. I'll show you guys in a second. But um, the the sort of paradox of that piece of music is that you have to go up on stage and then be, be calm, um, which is, as, as all of you probably know, uh, fairly challenging. Um, so from a technical perspective, I use this OpenBCI headset. Um, it's a fantastic headset for anybody who's looking at doing EEG stuff. Um, you do have to do some 3D printing. Here is a replacement for the uh, board cover on my Photon. Um, this was an Arduino-based thing. Uh, this is a very unclean project that uses uh, a relay board to control a bank of DC or AC power, power outlets. Um, although the fun story about that is I went to pick it up right before I did the performance, uh, and I actually bridged the relay with my hand. So I had to play the first like 20 minutes of the performance without being able to feel my left arm because I soaked up too much mains current. Um, and I also built a bunch of instruments. I don't have them all documented on my website because a couple of them were, um, I don't know, not that cool, but. Uh, here's one, the speaker cone would move up and down in response to the alpha waves, um, and that would kind of scrape these threaded rods on these brass plates, and that would just move and rattle. That one's, that one's always fun to hear. Um, one thing to note is that the reason why I used resonant bodies like this, or I had to use other things to generate the sound, is because um, alpha alpha sound or alpha waves, the eight to 12 Hertz range is well below the human hearing range. Um, human hearing range traditionally is defined as 20 Hertz to 20,000 Hertz. So 20 cycles per second to 20,000 and alpha, as I said right here, is only eight to 12. So it's uh, it's more of a control idea than a like a sound idea on its own. Um, although you could you could probably amplify it enough to hear it, but you'd need, you'd need a lot of gear. Um, this is like my little diagram of the signal. So the next thing actually, so moving on, scroll down here, uh, was a, a piece I built and premiered as part of a fellowship that I had. Oh, what did, what did you do? Okay. A uh, fellowship I had at the New England Conservatory's uh, Summer Institute for Contemporary Performance Practice. Um, in in Boston, um, and I'll show you guys a little bit of that. So this was uh, an installation work of sorts. Um, it it functioned as a neurofeedback installation. Um, essentially, anytime you have your unconscious EEG process is controlling external phenomena, and you're building a neurofeedback installation um, because your brain will try to figure out, uh, you know, your brain likes any reward, right? This is why we eat too many chips. Um, but uh, your brain likes any reward and it will, it will try to seek out that reward if that exists. And sound as a result of thought process, which is essentially what this was, is a reward as far as the human brain is concerned. Um, so this was, you know, I ended up doing a lot uh, here. Um, this this ended up using multiple copies of a, uh, uh, Maxim SP copies of a, sub, a synthesizer, a legendary synthesizer called an ARP 2600 um, that I, I made parallel inside of Poly. Um, and that was actually the week I learned, I learned to use Poly, so that was, that was a fun week. Um, so, uh, the, the installation itself was uh, interactive. So I was sitting in this room for quite some time. Uh, it ended up being about eight hours um, where the, and the audience or the, the, I guess, gallery space visitors um, were invited to come in and disrupt my performance and, or disrupt my focus rather. They, they ended up being the performance conceptually. Um, so they kind of, they were instructed to come in and sort of disrupt my calmness. And by doing so, the EEG data was routed through the synthesizers, which changed the sound in the room. So it kind of created this sort of extra level of, um, 
extra level of expression, basically, because the, uh, the internal processes of my brain operating when interacting with uh, the audiences were externalized. Um, so yeah, and that is, that's actually the end of my presentation. That's all I have to talk about. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring this back up. Uh -oh. wow, thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Ed. Uh, does any anyone has a question to add for now? So, yeah. um, that remind me of Vipassana. Now, <laughs> yeah, uh, how to measure uh, this data of our brain, uh, the electrodes of uh, uh, for brain? What kind of electrodes uh, do you use for to measure? Oh, um, I can actually show you real quick. Um, hold on. Got my, my thing right here. Um, so there's a couple different ways to do that. Uh, in a clinical setting, they use they usually use gold cup electrodes um, with a conductive paste. But as I don't like putting goo in my hair. Um, what instead the OpenBCI headset uses, and um, to a lesser extent the headset I'm making, uh, uses what we call dry electrodes. Uh, the signal quality isn't quite as good, but they're not as messy. Um, I can kind of, I think I can kind of get this really close. So you can okay. kind of see the end there is pointy, and that's, um, that is, pokes through your hair so it can actually get contact with the scalp. Okay. Um, yeah. And this is, they're made out of a, uh, a gold doped plastic. So they have fairly low, um, fairly low resistance. Uh-huh. Cool. So do you, so you say you, you are using it as a, you, you, you are, in your performance, you are turning artist uh, as a, a proxy. Uh, to me, I'm not quite. I'm not sure. I'm quite get it, but uh, it's like you're using the performance subconsciousness. Yeah, so basically, you, you're not uh, really. Well, so every depend. So different different performance. If you put different people in a in a in a performance. As the proxy, you get a different uh, results, something. Yeah, mostly. Um, so there's actually a surprisingly wide variance in, um, in how people's brains work. Um, I mentioned I mentioned Alpha a lot this this time, um, although I don't always work with Alpha. But uh, there's, um, I mean anybody's anybody's mental state i mean if you come in especially anxious you're going to get different data um or and there's some people uh traditionally when you close your eyes your alpha waves will spike um it's just kind of one of those one of those biological things but there are some people for whom that is actually inverted so when they close their eyes their alpha waves uh almost disappear so yes essentially um you know the uh, there's there's definitely like a human a human element there, if that makes sense. I mean it's it's super variable. And uh, one more question: I'm interested in this word neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity, yeah. So it's so uh, so everyone has holds different neuroplasticity, and uh, it's it's always growing. <laughs> um. So the, yeah, basically. I mean, the quality of neuroplasticity is pretty universal. Um, we're all, I mean, it's every time you learn something new, you're experiencing neuroplasticity, right? So your brain is, is rewiring itself on some level to accommodate new knowledge. Or you learned, a, I don't know, you learned to chop onions really fast. So that's, that's neuroplasticity happening. It's just, it's also possible to build systems that leverage that phenomenon to, um, alleviates certain symptoms. There's also uh, what I've done mostly, which is what we call peak performance, which is a lot about, um, it's, it's more about like, <laughs> in a lot of respects, suppressing fight or flight response. Um, 
But so neuroplasticity itself is just the quality of your brain being able to adapt to external stimuli and learn. Um, yeah. <laughs> so in a way, can you kind of explain what is awareness by this neuroplasticity? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, I mean, I do. <laughs> uh, I mean, awareness via neuroplasticity? Maybe, um, maybe it's just too early in the morning and I'm not, I'm not following. Um, uh, it's okay. We, we, can, we can continue the discussion under your host. Sure, sure. Yeah, I have, I have many questions. Yeah, I'm <laughs> happy to answer them. Cool, super cool. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I have, I have another question is that when you are developing this kind of projects, uh, do you have uh, work with or collaborate with any other like neurobiologists or research lab or professional or you are kind of like a self developing everything? Uh, a little of both really. Um, my, this, this might, I don't, I don't know. This is, probably a weird archaic concept. I don't, I'm not entirely sure, but my godmother. Um, so like basically my legal guardian, more or less in, in sort of a term, uh, she's actually a neurofeedback practitioner. She's on the board for the International Neurofeedback Association. So I have connections with the, pro the professional worlds of this, these techniques. Um, I was actually supposed to perform at their concert over or their conference over the summer, but that that all got canceled because of coronavirus. Um, but overall, most of the things I've done is just kind of me developing, you know, reading the research papers and then building it on my own. I see, thank you. Okay, do we have any other question for Ed? Or I think it's time for us to move on to Lynn. Yeah. Only, only one question. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Do Please, Maria. you have um, uh, free workshops uh, uh, for to measure uh, neuroplasticity or or electrodes? Uh, is for a workshop? Um, you know, topics. Oh, I, you know, I don't, but I really should. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll. Maybe I'll come up with like, maybe I'll make like a YouTube video with an introduction to some of these techniques. I mean, I'm kind of halfway there with the presentation I did today. So uh, look for that coming soon, maybe. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ed. So next one, like, let, let's welcome Lynn to share.